everyone, on this episode of Real Estate Syndicate Alive, I got to interview my good buddy, Tom Wheelwright. Tom is probably best known as being the rich dad advisor to Robert Kiyosaki when it comes to taxes. Uh, he is the author of a plethora of books, uh, most notably Tax-Free Wealth, How to Build Massive Wealth by Permanently Lowering Your Taxes, and his most recent book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of WealthAbility and is probably most known as being a, one of the foremost experts in tax and wealth strategies. On this episode, we talked about how in order to change your tax, you have to change your facts. We also talked about how the tax code is really just a series of incentives to have you do what the government wants you to do. We talked about the seven investments the government will pay you to make, and also that the more income you make, the more taxes you pay, but the more wealth you build, the less taxes you pay because the government actually wants you to bid wealth. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode with Tom Wheelwright. Welcome back to episode number 32 of the Real Estate Syndicate Alive. And today I'm beyond excited to have my good buddy, Tom Wheelwright in the house. Tom, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Mauricio, I'm always happy to be with you. It is uh, literally uh, the tax filings here are coming up uh, next week. At the end of this week, actually, though, whatever. The it's uh, Monday, Monday, Monday. So, Monday is the final due date, like it or not. No more <laughs> extensions. So really, really appreciate it. Um, so anyway, so guys, if you have your questions, drop them in the chat, please. I'm going to start, Tom, with two of my favorite quotes uh, that you have. And I, I just want to throw them out there. And then I want you to sort of, if you don't mind, give us your thoughts, your comments. Uh, one of them, it, well, actually, there's actually three quotes, actually. These are two of the three, because the third one of my favorite quote, which I always use, is that Mauricio is one of the few lawyers that actually speaks English, which I really there love. You and there you go. There you go. I'll, I'll, stand, I'll stand by it. Unless but, these guys convince me differently. <laughs> but uh, one of them, one of the two quotes is, uh, in order to change your tax, you must change your facts. And then the second quote, which I always, which I always use is that the tax code is like a roadmap. It's a, it's a series of incentives that the government uh, gives you. So in order for you to do what they want you to do. And in fact, the tax code, I've never read it, but it's about 7,000 or 10, I don't know how many thousand pages. And you always say there's about 50 pages or so, or maybe 80 pages that are dedicated to actually paying tax. And the rest of them are how to actually, you know, do what the government wants you to do. So can you talk a little bit about those two quotes? Because I think that, I don't know if everybody's heard those quotes before, but they've always stuck with me and I always use them all the time. Yeah. So, so the first one, uh, if you want to change your tax, you need to change your facts. Um, that's probably the one I get quoted on the most. Um, and basically what, what the reality is, is that, you know, for example, everything's deductible. And so the question is not, or let me change the, change the wording. Everything could be deductible. So the question is not, is it deductible? So if I've got this very handsome wealth ability mug here, the question is not, if I buy this mug, is it deductible? The question is, if I buy, how would I buy this mug and make it deductible? So, and so I look at the job of the tax advisor to ask the questions to help give you choices. So to me, it's always a choice. And you, you, you need to know the, the basics. You need to know what facts do I need to change? So really your tax advisor's job is to, is to find out your facts, find out what you're trying to accomplish. What do you want your taxes to be? How do you want that to work? And then let you know, okay, you can do that provided you do this. So let me give you a very simple example, okay? Um, I want to deduct my travel. I want to deduct my vacation. Great. I can tell you how to do that. It's really simple. If you're traveling with the continental, if you're traveling with the United States, not just continental United States, Hawaii and Alaska count too. Uh, if you're if you're traveling within the United States, then you need to spend of a an eight hour workday, more than four hours, working um, in that place, doing something you could not do from your regular place of business. So you have to do it there. Okay. So, for example, let's say that you are a real estate investor. And you're going, I'm going to meet with, I'm going to go look for real estate properties. I'm, I want to go to Alaska in um, August, September. I've heard it's beautiful, which it is, by the way. September is fabulous up in Anchorage. Been there, um, done that. And, um, but I'd like it to be deductible. Okay, well, great. So I'm going to go 
look for real estate up there. I'm gonna I'm gonna meet with uh, realtors. I'm gonna meet with investors. I'm gonna that I'm gonna do things that I could only do there. Okay, well then you so, some people think like me. Do I want to do that? And for me, right. I when I want to go on vacation, I don't want to work. I want a break. But I will tell you that I have clients that absolutely every day, four and a half hours. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So back in the day when I was um, tax in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company, there's a group of tax geeks. Um, <laughs> Aren't they all except for that, you? <laughs> that are in, we're all, I'm a tax geek too. Uh, um, I'm the geekiest of all the tax geeks. But there, there's a group of tax um, professionals that is just for um, in-house. Okay. So they would have every year, they'd have their annual conference called the Tax Executives Institute. And they would have their annual conference. Guess what? You would have training from eight in the morning until 1230 in the afternoon every day. And then the rest of the day, you got to go do whatever you want. And sometimes they even come up with excursions to do together. Right. Okay. Well, that wasn't, um, that wasn't by accident that they did four and a half hours a day. Let me tell you, they knew what they were doing. I mean, these are the, these are the heads of tax departments of fortune 500 companies. So these are not, you know, these, these are no slouches here. Um, and, and so we, and we used to do the same thing, by the way, you know, with the law firm and stuff, we'd go on a retreat for the weekend and guess what? We would do meetings for, you know, four hours a day on, on there you Friday go. And, then, and then get the there you go. And then, you know. and then you do four and a half hours a day on Monday and then the weekend was yours. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So that's an example of, okay, yes, every day, every work day, every work day. So you, there's a question uh, Alan asked. Um, so every day you have to four plus hours. It can't be four hours. It has to be more than four <laughs> hours. Okay. The, the rule is the primary reason you went was to, to do business. Okay. That was the reason for the trip. And the only way you can show that is that you spend more time doing business than not doing business. Okay. Now, if you go overseas, it's different. It's proportionate. So if you do it in the U.S., it's all or none. If you do it overseas, it's proportionate. But that's a good example of change your facts, change your tax, okay? Are you willing to do that? But see, remember, your, your tax advisor's job is to give you the choice. It's your job to make the choice. But the tax advisor is there to help you get, tell you what you need to do in order to make that choice. Yeah, and so and, and most of us here are real estate, or all of us, I think, are real estate syndicators. So same thing for when, you know, we, we attend so many conferences, right? You and I just came back from the real estate guys one, but, you know, everyone here is attending conferences all the time. So same thing for them, as long as they spend more than four hours every day, uh, they can deduct that whole trip and, and throw in yeah, a vacation sure. there while they're, oh, while they're at it. Absolutely. Now, it's, it's going to be four and, a, four and a half hours a day during the week, right? I mean, because weekends, remember, we're talking about I mean, the IRS, that's government, right? So they, don't, they barely work four <laughs> hours a day anyway, but they, they, they certainly don't work more than five days a week. They're prohibited by their union from working more than five days a week. So they can't prohibited by the union from working more than 40 hours a week. So remember, that's who you're, you always have to think, who am I talking to? You're really talking to the IRS here. You're not talking to Congress. You're never going to talk to Congress. You are talking to the IRS. Okay. Now you got here. Here's a question about the, the uh, cruise. Cruise has their own rules. I will say though, you can change your facts to get the cost of the cruise deductible. We don't have time for that today, but let me, uh, but I'll tell you where you can find it. <laughs> Absolutely I fabulous book here called The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. The last chapter of this book is how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari. Well, you can get them to pay for a cruise a lot easier than you can get them to pay for a Ferrari, but you can absolutely do either one, okay? Um, I, uh, so so to, for Mauricio, <laughs> so y'all know Mauricio's from Chile, right? So the very, so, so this actually, I learned this in Chile. He read that. Yes. You know this story. I do right? know the story. Yeah. I was good. I was, I'm bummed. I missed that. You guys are all in all the rich dad guys. No, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, Santiago. We're, we're all down and we're in Santiago. And the very first day, Robert says, I want you. To, so the sponsor of the event was the Lamborghini Bentley dealer. 
And so on one side of the stage was a Lamborghini and the other side of the stage was a Bentley. So he goes, I want you to teach him how to deduct a Bentley. Robert drives a Bentley. Uh, Kim was driving a Lamborghini at the time. I said, okay. So I went through the normal rules and the tests and everything. And then at, at, at lunch, this tax attorney from Santiago comes up to me and he was really nice. And he says, I just want you to know, I, I get you can do that in the US, but you can't do that here. That um, cars are considered luxury. So I'm that evening, I'm telling the story to Robert and the other advisors. And Robert just looks at me and goes, that's interesting. Next morning, we're about to go on stage. He turns to me, says, Tom, today we're going to teach them how to legally deduct a Bentley in Chile. <laughs> and I've learned over the years, you just go with the, you just go with it with Robert. The, the, um, the universe will provide. Okay. Uh, you know, if you're religious, God will provide the universe will provide if you just go with it. And sure enough, Sure enough, we we went through the same is a very similar example to what I have in Win Win Wealth Strategy back here, and um, afterwards at the end of the event, the same tax attorney came up to me and said, "Tom, I would never have thought of doing it that way. It would absolutely work." Yeah, hundred percent. And and by the way, that by the way, let me just go backtrack. I was so pumped to have you here, Tom, that I forgot to mention your books right off the gate. But, you know, tax free wealth, which is, I think, where this, these quotes, original quotes are coming from, tax free yes. wealth, which I think you wrote about 10 years ago now. Um, yeah. I, pro I, I promised everyone, an, not everyone, someone, an autographed copy of this. So I'm going to give it to you in a second. And then, of course, the win win wealth uh, uh, strategy, the seven, the seven investments the government will pay you to make. This is the newest book you had. And this is where the Ferrari story is right at the end. And a lot of folks on the live are actually gonna, who are going to watch this are. Um, Brad, Brad Sumrock students. And it is a Brad Sumrock uh, example. I know he could. It is it. actually, it's a, it's a real life example. Yeah. Um, and I was in, um, okay. So real estate guys was like a month ago. Yeah. I was the, the week after I was there with the real estate guys, I was there with Brad Sumrock in Dallas. Last week I was there with Buck Joffrey in Dallas. So three, three weekends in a row in Dallas, three weeks in a row talking to real estate investors. And uh, Brad had, so, so, so true story, Mauricio. So I'm in my, I'm the Uber driver is pulling up to the hotel and there's Brad's Ferrari sitting out there, you know, of course, right. Of course. I mean, if you got a, you got a Ferrari at your hotel, you're going to park it out front. Especially if you're so, shy, like Brad. Well, no, I mean, he didn't park it. You know, the ballet's going to park <laughs> right, it. There, right, right, right. This that's is right, advertising right, the hotel. That's right. And there were guys out there taking pictures of it. And, and the Uber driver's laughing. He said, oh, those guys taking pictures of that Ferrari. I'm sure it's not theirs. I said, no, it's not. I actually know the guy who owns that. He's a buddy of mine. And um, so there was Brad's Ferrari. So, of course, I had to go take a picture of it because I'm going, okay, here you go. It's in the book. Same, same ones in the book, but literally all those numbers in the book are, are true. They're real yeah. numbers. Yeah. Um, Brad's a client of mine. I can tell you that because he's very public about it, but yeah. um, it, it's a um, thank you, Francis. So uh, she can't wait to win, read win, win, wealth straight. It's a great book. It covers 15 countries, by the way. So yeah. we, we actually looked at 15 countries um, and uh, the tax and how tax incentives work in 15 countries and what the government gets out of them. So and you got um, go, of, let's go. And you do you want to go to your next, the uh, second wait. question, the second quote there? <laughs> I don't know if I need to be here. I see you, you can ask the questions from the chat. You can ask the question. So you can ask and answer the questions. I'm just going to go take a break and, and you can just run with it, my friend. <laughs> uh, but, but you're the pretty face. So we need you. <laughs> uh, um, no, the, 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 other, the other quote, not really necessarily the question is the roadmap, right? Cause yeah. Cause that's so, really so, so, so here's, um, let me give you the official quote. Yeah. So uh, did I butcher it? Did I butcher it? Uh, no, you're, you're close. You're close enough for, you're close enough for government work. And that's what we're talking <laughs> about here. So it's all good. Um, the, so the tax law is about 6,000 pages, the actual law itself, not the regulations, not all the other stuff, just the, just the law. And there's one line in the tax law that says all incomes taxable, unless we say it isn't. And there's one line in the tax law that says nothing is deductible unless we say it is. There's about 28, 29 pages of charts and tables to tell you how much tax to pay. And literally the other 5,970 odd pages are a roadmap to reducing your taxes. Here's the thing. This started back in the 1960s. And I talk about this in Win Win Wealth. I don't talk about it in Tax-Free Wealth, but I, I go into the history in Win Win Wealth. Uh, President Kennedy 
um, was not the first one to use it, but he was the first one to use it big time. And we were having a, there was a recession going on. He wanted to simulate manufacturing. And that's where the investment tax credit came from um, in the 1960s. That was President Kennedy. And um, so he goes, well, wait a minute. Will this work? You know, let's try it. Will it work? And sure enough, it did. Of course, people hate paying tax. So it works even better than you thought it would because it's not a, just an incentive because it's money. It's an incentive because it's something you don't want to do in the first place. Right. Right. So it's got this huge, it, this huge incentive. I literally have had clients over the years that would have spent $3 to save a dollar in tax. I don't recommend that, but I have had those clients. And, um, and so Kennedy did it. And then it kind of, snowballed from there. The next president to really do it big time, though, was um, although it was 1976 act was actually a big act, um, which would have been the end of Jimmy Carter's term. Right. Um, and I'm sorry. Yeah, no, the end of. Um, um, sorry, president before Jimmy Carter. Quick, Mauricio, Gerald Ford, Gerald Ford's term. OK, so, so 1976, there was a big tax act, but Ronald Reagan did it big time in 1981, 82, 84, and 86. Okay, so he had four major tax acts while Reagan was president. Um, there was another one actually in 87 that was a little smaller. It was just a clarification, um, but he did a lot of tax. While, while Volcker was raising the interest rates, um, Reagan was stimulating investment. So was it that, was it was the tax code a lot less back then though before the for before Kennedy not, started not, it, or was not, it always not, that long? No, no, yeah. not really, okay. not really. Um, I, it it was. I mean, he added a lot of real estate incentives. He added all the depreciation incentives, right. Right. Um, and um, and then uh, in '86, of course, he took all the incentives away <laughs> and just lowered all the tax rates. Right. So um, so that was, by the way, Art Laffer, who has endorsed win-win wealth strategy. Nice. So, so which is uh, super nice, um, nice to get uh, Art Laffer's, uh, Dr. Art Laffer's endorsement. He was the architect of Reaganomics. Yeah. Um, so talk, talk, let, let me ask you. So, let, let's, so, so, so what I mean by that is that re so really what we have is a bunch of incentives. So really what the tax code does is it tells you what you need to do in order to get those incentives. Right. It's it's not it's not really punishment. I mean, there's some of it right, right there. I mean, there are penalties in there. There is some, you know, punishment if you don't do things the right way. But really what they're saying is do it the right way. There's no and there's no penalties. Right. Do do what you're supposed to do. But there are there's incentives for so many different things. And in win win wealth, what I did was I went through the seven primary categories of investments that the government encourages. Right. And those, those are just so everybody knows there's business, technology, real estate, energy, agriculture, insurance, and retirement plans. Right. Correct. I, I want to focus, obviously, everyone here is real estate. And I think everybody is either has a business or has aspirations to turn their uh, real estate syndication career into a business. But I did have a lot of questions about those syndicators who haven't quite been able to retire from their W-2 job, still have kind of a W-2 job, or maybe you're a passive investor with a W-2 job. D does, does the tax code, is it, does the, the, all of these incentives, do they apply to people with W-2 or is it a little bit harder if you're earning W-2 income? I will say you need a better tax advisor if you're earning <laughs> W-2 income. <laughs> that, it, it's not impossible, but it's harder. Um, business is, I mean, I mean, you got to remember, uh, by the way, these are in order of, of importance. Okay. So real, uh, business is the most important for jobs. sure. They want jobs, uh, uh, jobs, jobs, and then technology. They want technology, right? They want innovation. So real and, and actually other countries incentivize technology way more than the U S. Okay. Um, but, but real estate technology, I mean, business technology, but remember, if you're doing investment real estate, you are in business. So you're getting all the business tax benefits and then you're adding in the real estate tax benefits. And then you can add on specific tax benefits like low income housing credit, like, uh, an, uh, or um, historic credits. You know, there's very specific credits or then you can go to the next chapter, which is energy. 
and you can put solar energy on your real estate and have it all be a business. And so now you're comp you've got compounding effect. Okay. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that the last one, which is the least important, is the retirement planning, um, which is, by the way, the only one where the government doesn't make money. Right. The government does not make money. They break even. They don't make money. Um, the, the one that everybody thinks is okay is the one that is the least valuable to the government from a financial standpoint. They make money on all the others. So um, the government actually comes out ahead on everything else quite a bit. Um, usually the government will come out more ahead as an investor. Think of them as an investor, okay? They're going to come out more ahead. What they're doing is, remember, here's, here's what's going on. When the government puts in money as an investment, which is what they do when they give you bonus depreciation, for example, right? Um, bonus depreciation is big enough now that if you do it right, you could easily end up with the government. You put in, say, $100,000, the government gives you $50,000 back in tax benefits. And so the government, what you're doing is you're reducing your risk by 50% because now you don't have $50,000 $50, in the in, into the project. I mean, $100,000 into the project, you have $50,000 into your project. So I always look at it that way. I look at what's my return on investment after I get my government money back. I never look at the government money as a return on investment. I know a lot of syndicators do. I think that's a huge mistake because it's a one-time benefit and then it reverses. But if you look at it as the government's putting in part of the money, the government's literally paying you to make that investment then what's going on is now you're an active partner with the government and they're, you're taking some money off the table. It's no different than refinancing. The whole point of refinance, take risk, take money off the table, right? right? And that's what you do with the government. The government gets, but the, with the government, you get to do it year one. You don't get to do that with financing until year three, four, five, whatever. Right. But with taxes, you get to do it year one. And that's that's why that's so important is because you're taking you're reducing your risk and the risk of your investors significantly by letting the government contribute. And I think a lot of syndicators and lim well, limited partners are they're actually with the bonus depreciation, which I know is going to be starting to get phased out here next year. But they're actually getting not quite 100 percent, but a lot of them can, are, are structuring in such a way to get close to 80 percent. 100% in year one, is that that you agree with Oh, that? Uh, their investment? It, yeah. it, it depends on your, your rate of leverage, okay? Um, if you're 80% leveraged, right. you're absolutely going to get 100%. Right. You can even get 100 and anywhere 120 to 150% year one right. of your investment. If you're, you know, and then it goes down, depends on what your leverage is. I mean, a lot of people are down at 60 to 65% right now because they're of the interest rates and lending yeah, and all covered, that kind of yeah, stuff. But, so, so that also reduces, you know, the amount, the percentage of your investment that, that the government is covering with a deduction. Yeah. I've also heard you say that because of these uh, bonus depreciation and all this, the stuff is that you, we're almost in a sort of a, a consumption tax kind of environment, right? Like yeah. you actually, you actually get, you get taxed when you actually consume stuff. If you actually just took your money and invested so in real I, estate I, energy. I, I'll give you a couple more quotes. Here for right. you. Okay. Right, you ready? It. You're going to want to write these down, guys. I'm ready. Um, just, just make sure you, you know, attribute them to me and then we're fine. Okay. <laughs> the first one is um, uh, you only get taxed on what you save or spend. You only get taxed on the money you save or spend. If you invest it in true investment, and by the way, stock market's not true investment. Stock market, you're investing in a derivative. Remember, stock's a derivative of the actual business. But if you were to invest in the actual business, you'd get the same benefit, right? Right. So if you, if you, do, if you do originating investment, you should not pay tax on the income that you put into that investment. Okay, so we really do have a consumption tax. Well, consumption plus savings tax, right? right. Okay, but things that you do for yourself, you get taxed on. Things you do for other people, you don't. So- Here's another quote. The more generous you are, the less tax you pay. And I'm not talking about giving money away. I'm talking about building housing for other people instead of building it for yourself. I'm talking about creating jobs for other people instead of just a job for yourself. I'm talking about creating energy for other people instead of just energy for yourself. So you put energy on your personal, you put solar on your personal residence, you get a 30% tax credit. That's pretty cool. But if you put it on your business, you get a 30% tax credit plus an 85% deduction. That's oh, way more cool. Right. 
Okay, because the 85 percent 80, deduction in a thirty in a thirty seven to forty percent tax bracket is worth more than the thirty percent tax credit. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's that's number two. But here's the third one for you. Okay, you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, the more money I make, the more tax I pay. The more wealth I build, the less tax I pay. Yeah. I like that the one. more money I make, the more tax I pay, the more wealth I build, the less tax I pay. The government wants you to build wealth. They don't want you to make more money. So even when they talk about the rich, okay, the rich who make a lot of money, by the way, they pay a lot of tax. But the rich who just build a lot of assets don't pay a lot of tax or don't have to. It's their choice. Like, you know, Elon Musk paid a lot of tax last year. That was his choice. Love it. All right. Let me, let me catch my breath here, Tom. Cause uh, it's just, you, you got, I think I have a lot of anybody agree that I, I think I have a lot of energy, but Tom, I think, well, I think I know uh, overcomes it. Um, you know, Sep, Sep, uh, Sep, I'm going to read your question, buddy, but Sep was smart enough to, to include in his question, a, uh, a plug for your book. So that's always a good way to get your question on here. <laughs> but uh, Sep said, Hey, Tom, I just finished your fantastic audiobook of the win-win st uh, wealth strategy. In the book, you gave an interesting example of tax law provisions that allow significant tax savings if companies were to invest in new engineering and or science research. Seps an engineer, mm -hmm. former engineer. Uh, is it possible for real estate syndicators to utilize this strategy in their businesses? Uh, what is their criteria to pass the IRS requirement of these tax savings? Can you, can you mix it with the syndicator? Is that purely- Yeah, no, the... of course. So let, let me give you an example, okay? And I actually happen to know a real example here. Um, I will, I will not share his name. You'd probably know him because um, he didn't say I could. But let's say that you were to develop a new way, a new type of security system for your buildings. That would be innovation. That would qualify. Okay. Or let's say you d developed a new software, a new way to handle uh, rents and stuff like that. Okay. Now it would have to be really new. Okay. You, I mean, you can't do a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets don't, it, it actually has to have a function. It actually has to do something more than say a spreadsheet. Okay. Um, more than a website, but um, software does qualify. Okay. If it's true software and not just a spreadsheet um, or just a website, but, it, but true software does qualify. So yeah, there are, um, I mean, we, for example, in, uh, so we have this network of CPA firms, right? So we just launched software to facilitate our members um, helping their clients develop their wealth and tax strategy. We absolutely qualify for research to develop tax credit for that. Right. Um, I just saw, by the way, I just saw something in the chat, which, which, struck me because I think it's, I think it's Alan. Uh, he, he, I could tell from the tone of his question that he's, he's, he's worried about taxes already. He says, don't remind us. It's almost time to worry about taxes next year too, which, which I want you to address. Yeah. I know, I know you get pumped sure. about taxes. I get pumped about taxes, but talk a little bit about end of year planning, number one, but also the concept of, I, I love the concept about the rear view mirror versus looking forward. Like most CPAs, are just dealing with history and they're doing your taxes and it's like you owe or you don't owe. But what you've always done is, yes, you're a CPA, but you're really a, a, a tax and wealth strategist, right? You're trying to figure right. out how do I eliminate or reduce taxes? And that all gets done in the planning phase, not, you know, not on April 14th, right? Right. And, you know, our, our clients all have a goal of building wealth. Taxes are a critical part of building wealth. They're the single biggest expense. So, you can't build significant wealth with and pay a lot of tax. It's really hard. You have to make an awful lot of money to do that, right? You have to be LeBron James to do that. Um, but you can do it if you don't pay a lot of tax. So um, I we've actually changed something this year in my, I've got a little CPA firm. I handle people like Robert Kiyosaki and Brad Sumrat and um, only a few clients. And we did something different this year, Mauricio. We took everybody and said, we're going to put you on a flat monthly fee and we're going to start our year-end tax planning in January. And then we're going to do it again. In, we're going to do it again in February and again in March and again in April. And we're going to do it every single month. And that's what we've been doing this year. It's been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, which means 
that when it comes time for your estimated tax payments, you know what it is. By the end of the year, you're not doing year end tax planning. You're just doing November tax planning and December tax planning because you've been doing tax planning all year round, right? Now, unless you've got a, a like a, a cyclical business that has a you know big income in December, right. but if you do, that's fine. You probably know that ahead of time and let's plan for that. So I'm a, I'm a very big fan of year round tax planning, not such a big fan of year end tax, uh, year end tax planning. What the, the reason you do it at the year end is because you really do need, you do want to know how much, you know, where am I? I think you ought to know where you are every quarter um, at a minimum, but I, I think the year end planning is old school. And it's what, I mean, a lot of CPAs still don't even do that. But when you think about year in planning, you think about, oh, I'm going to make my mortgage, January mortgage payment early. What do you do? Okay. Now there are some things you can do. If you had, let's say your retail establishment, um, you could buy inventory at the end of the year, right? Because inventory now is fully deductible when you buy it, if you make the election. So there are some things you can do at the end of the year. Um, you could... But there's, investment, there's investments you can make though. There are certain things. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I do the, I don't do it monthly. We do it quarterly, but there's certainly like, you know, crap, I'm going to end up with a big tax bill. What investments can I make? Let's say. Yeah. But why not? Why not make those investments in January? Why not make them in? Because they're I mean, listening. They're listening to you right now. And it's because already, here's, it's, here's the problem. The problem is, so this is the same problem. It's, it's the 1031 dilemma, right? It's the 1031 dilemma. I'm going to do a 1031. You'll know what 1031s are. Yep. But the problem with 1031 is you have 45 days to identify the property you're going to buy and then 180 days to close. Well, so what it does is it tends to encourage in people to make bad decisions because they're making decision. They're forcing the decision based on tax instead of making it for the investment purpose and right. getting the tax benefit. Right. So if you make it early in the year, if you know what you're, where you are all the time and you make those decisions early in the year, I mean, like right now, you couldn't go find a multifamily property and close by year end. I mean, it's, right. been, it's, it's practically impossible, right? A good multi, because they're hard to find right now, right? So you couldn't find a good property with good cap rate, good interest rate, get the loan, do all that. You can't do that. In nine, you, can, in, you, can pa in, you can passively invest in someone's deal though, right? Well, if they've already been working on it, yeah. 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 But, but they've got all, already be in process. But if you're a syndicator, you're not going to be able sure, to do that. Sure, sure. So that's my point is that it's much better to make this a wealth strategy that is supported by your tax strategy rather than just a tax strategy. This is why I have such a, and it, it's, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's tough enough to convince CPAs to do tax strategy. It's practically impossible to, convince them to do wealth strategy. And the reason is, is because CPAs as a general rule are not comfortable with money. They're not at all comfortable with money. And that's a, by, by, the, by the way, an industry secret. I just let it out. <laughs> um, uh, CPAs, uh, CPA stands for cheapest people in America. And I, I thought um, it was can't protect assets. Well, that that's our, <laughs> our friend says that, but uh, I, I, I actually believe it stands for cheapest people. Actually, Actually, my wife, Luann, says it, it stands for cheapest people anywhere. So, <laughs> and, and what, well, but you know, if somebody's cheap, it's because they don't, probably because they don't understand money, right. right? And I mean, for example, you hire a cheap CPA. Well, it's because you don't understand the tax law. If you understood the tax law, if you could get, if you could get a hundred percent return on your investment, okay or if even a 50% return on your investment. And, and you could put $10,000 into it. The first thing you're going to say is, well, could I put 20,000? Could I put 100,000? And the answer is, when it comes to tax advice, sometimes the answer is yes. The, the more, there, there come, there's a limit, just like there is putting money back into your business, right? There's a limit. But I've had clients come to me. Um, I don't take clients anymore, but when they were coming to me, they would, uh, my flat fee for six to 12 months of a wealth and tax strategy was $200,000. I have, they're lined up. Okay. And the reason is because they're paying six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in tax and they can get a, a, a lifetime two, 300% return on their investment. 
um, why wouldn't you? I mean, why would you pay $10,000 for somebody who can save you $10,000? If you can say, spend $200,000, somebody can save you $500,000. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, this is not difficult, uh-huh. right? You just spend more money to, to do it. But that, that it's, it, you know, you really do have to focus though on, you really, first question we always ask people is, what are you gonna do with your money? Because how you do your tax strategy is totally dependent on what you're gonna do with the money. So if you're gonna put it all in real estate, great. But my guess is you're not all putting all your money in real estate. You're probably putting it somewhere else too. Um, you know, some people come in and they say, well, I'm, I, I, I don't know. In fact, I would say 95% of entrepreneurs don't know what they're gonna do with their money. Now you guys do, you're real estate syndicators. I presume you do, but here's the other thing. I have real estate syndicators come to me that don't put money in their own deal. That's ridiculous. I, I literally had a, I had a real estate developer, big developer. And he came to me and he said, he said, uh, I said, Tom, I, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about diversifying in the stock market and going into these, these stock investments. I'm going, so let me understand. You can buy real estate at wholesale prices, but you'd rather invest retail. That's like saying, that's like saying, I know, I, I know somebody at at um I know somebody at Gucci that you know I uh, that can get me Gucci shoes wholesale, but I think I'd rather buy um Ferragamo at retail. Right. Are you kidding me? Why are you doing that? Okay. I mean, you like, if you like Gucci shoes, like I do, um, wh- why would you do that? So, uh, and, and <laughs> he, he never forgot it. He, he reminds me of it every, you know, all the yeah. time. He goes, you remember when you said, yeah, I remember because you were doing it. But I, uh, so I was talking to 1200 real estate agents the other day, 1200 real estate agents inside insiders. They can do, you guys can do inside trading right. legally. Yeah. And yet I know a bunch of, I know tons of syndicators. They take their carried interest and pay a huge amount of tax. I'm going, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I know other developers who won't do a cost segregation. I'm going, are you out of your mind? You're, first of all, you're cheating your investors. Second of all, why would you want? Why, why, right. would, why would you not do that? It just, right. I mean, they're just, to me, you know, I'm, I've been so involved for so long, Mauricio, that I, 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 get, I get frustrated because I just don't understand. Yeah, and in fact, I think that was one of the questions, actually. What, what, can, what can syndicators do? But that's a great example. Like, they just invest in your own deals. You've already got the inside track. You got, you're buying these things at wholesale. Put some money into it and, and get the same tax benefits that everybody else gets. Buy, buy the whole deal yourself. If you can, yeah. If you can, yeah. you, you've already got your management team. Think about how much more money you make with your deal than you would as an investor in somebody else's deal. Right. Twice as much. I mean, literally, it's twice as much, right? Because the other guy, the, 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 the syndicator, the developer has to take half the money to make it worth their while. So you're basically, so now you can make all of the money. <coughs> Absolutely. But this is a, this is a good transition to about uh, Paula was asking, and I, I'm not quite sure about the first question, but the second one's a good softball for you, one Tom. But the first one was, did the IRS lose your tax return from last year? Which I'm not sure what that refers <laughs> to. But number, I, two, I I know all about that. Okay, so then so that's got to be something, some inside thing that I'm not 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 tracking. So, so the IRS is a mess, Mauricio. Right. Absolutely a mess. They answer 10 percent of their phone calls. They lose tax returns. Um, they actually destroyed, they destroyed thousands and thousands of 1099s and W-2s. Are you kidding me? Thousands of them. That's why, by the way, that's the reason, uh, I don't know if you know, but all the penalties from 2020 are being forgiven. 2019, 2020, they're, they're being forgiven. The reason they're doing it is because the IRS can't match. <laughs> because they destroyed thousands of 1099s. It's not out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> yeah. Well, they'd like you to think that, but it's not. Her second question was, if you wanted to switch over to an accountant on your team, how do we do that? So let's, let's do a little plug about Thank uh, you. WealthAbility. So, WealthAbility.com. Very simple. Just WealthAbility.com. It's really simple. Um, in fact, I will just type it in here. 
And what's great about WealthAbility is that they actually match you with, with the, the proper accounting firm that matches what you need. If you're a W-2 employee, it's going to be different than if you're, you know, Brad Summer. Right. Oh, for sure. For, that's, why we, that's why we built the network in the first place. Right. So we, we had a CPA firm. Okay, which we don't have anymore. We, we sold five years ago. And, but the problem is we can only handle a certain bandwidth of clients, right? You, you, you can't handle the whole bandwidth. That it's, would be completely unprofitable. So what we decided was let's have a network of, uh, we actually have some EAs, enrolled agents, which are not, they're, they're pretend CPAs. So, <laughs> but they're, they're great. They're great for the, the W-2 person, or they're great for the independent contractor. Somebody's just starting out. They're great. And we have some of those. Okay. And they handle that type of work. And then we have people who handle very sophisticated stuff. Awesome. So wealthability.com, if you want to uh, check out uh, Tom's team. And then before I let you go, buddy, I cannot let you go because you haven't had enough energy in, uh, in this, in this uh, conversation so far. So I can't let you go without asking you about the CPA verification letters. Uh, Cause you've got a little, bit of <laughs> en- a little bit of energy behind that. I remember it, talking about it on stage uh, <laughs> last year, I think at the real estate guys. And I could literally see Tom in the corner of my eye, who's back in the corner of the room, jumping up and down <laughs> just in a thing. So, so CPA verification letters, obviously one of the ways you guys that are doing 506 C offerings, that's a way that you take reasonable steps to verify that your investors are accredited. You get that infamous CPA verification letter, unless you're asking Tom, Tom, Tell us a little bit about the CPA verification letter and why your firm or any, I presume none of your uh, uh, team members on. Well, here's the thing. Um, If, uh, if the CPA firms and insurance company ever found out they'd lose their insurance. Okay. Uh, You can't do it. It's a, it's actually in a test function. So we can, here's what we can do. And We've done it and it's been, I mean, we've done it for a number of clients and they're, it's, they're the attorney for the um, syndicator has been fine with it. Okay. So I don't know if you're just more conservative or what, uh, Mauricio, but what we can do is we can verify what was on your tax return. So we can say we prepare the tax return. The tax return shows this much income, or we can verify that the tax return shows this level of assets. We can do that. But what we can't do is we can't do a blanket. This person's an accredited investor or this person makes over $200,000 a year without qualifying it. Yeah. No, I think that'll work. I've, I've yet to see uh, a CPA verification that, that does that. They t- typically just want to take out language that kind of you know, obviously pushes away the, the exposure. And look, the, the SEC mentioned that in the rule when they wrote it, that they would anticipate some pushback from CPAs. And, you know, even though that'll work, they may or may not want to do it. But I, the, the important thing for me was I definitely have seen, just to let everybody knows, I've definitely seen a shift probably over the last two years where when this first thing came out, everybody was just signing the CPA verification, especially if you were, you know, a one man show, one woman show. But I've noticed definitely a trend over the last couple of years of more and more CPAs turning it down or trying to tweak the letter or change the letter where it really and, and it's not the CPA. I, I'm telling you it's not the CPA. No. Yeah. It's the CPA's insurance company yep. that, 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 that's, that's pushing back on that. And, and, and it, the, the reality is, is that we're not, we're, we, would, we could lose our license over that, okay? So the most valuable asset a CPA has is their license. Yep. And they will do anything to not lose their license, right? So you, please, be, please be mindful that that is a big deal to, to your CPA, and uh, if they, you know, the question is, how can I do this, right? It's like, how can I deduct? Not, can I deduct it? How can I deduct it? It's not, can I do the verification letter? How can I do the verification letter? And so we've actually gone back and forth. We came up with a really good language um, that we share uh, in our CPA, in my CPA firm, which is basically a guinea pig for all our other CPA firms. Right. And uh, we shared it and it's a, and we ha- there's been no pushback at all from any yeah. syndicators. Well, my friend, I appreciate it. I'll give you uh, one last plug here for the, if you haven't read tax free wealth, I, I, I don't know what's going on. You should definitely pick up a copy of tax. Wealth. I'm going to give one away after you leave here, Tom, I, I've kept you a couple minutes over and then the new one, the win-win wealth strategies, uh, check those out as well. Tom, we may have to have you back uh, because I mean, there's like another 150 questions that we didn't even get close to, to answering them. So uh 
I'll uh, I'll keep a copy of it and uh, maybe we'll do another follow up, uh, you know, when when time permits. But I appreciate you, buddy. Always good to talk to you. Great to see you. And uh, we'll see you soon, my friend. And I'm going to stick around. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it, Tom. Look at the Chris. Chris raising his hand already. All right, buddy. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, thank you for putting that on. Um, so my question is is like a hybrid. It's it's not a tax question, but maybe for anyone who's called Tom's company and you realize it's extremely expensive to do a lot of their programs, like how do you go about deciding how to pick your CPA and that whole firm and a tax strategist? And it, that might be more of a question for him, but I feel like a lot of times there's an extreme sticker shock that comes with people who in theory can save you money. Is there just like a theory that goes behind it that you can help those yeah, of us I mean, understand? I, all I would say is that Tom is is generally known to be affiliated with a particular firm that he's no longer affiliated with. And so his wealth ability literally takes that into account, which is why it's kind of a nice solution for everyone is that um, there's the whole gambit, right? You, you can do, if you're a W-2 employee earning you know $80,000 a year and you, you've got a couple of real estate deals on the side, you'll, they'll match you with a CPA firm that is not, uh, you know, not sticker shock. But if you're on the other hand, if you're Robert Kiyosaki and you're making who knows how much Robert's making, um, you, you know, you're going to spend a little bit more. So it runs the gambit. So uh, I, I can't answer the specific questions. I do think, though, that you should have a CPA no matter what, just like you should have an attorney that um, that knows real estate. Like that's to me is that's to me, that's one of the main factors in picking a CPA. Is do they know what, whatever asset class you're invested in, right? So I'm, I'm in real estate, I'm in energy and oil and gas. And so I want to make sure I've got a CPA that understands that business. Um, and, you know, my CPA happens to be, you know, with syndicators. And so he's involved with that. And then the, um, the other thing I would suggest is, again, we alluded to it in the, in the, in the interview, is that somebody who doesn't, at least for me anyway, somebody who doesn't just look in the rearview mirror, not, not somebody who just, you send them a bunch of documents and paperwork. And here's my 1099. Here's my W2. Here's my K1s. Please file my tax returns. Because honestly, I mean, you and I can file our own tax returns. You just go to TurboTax or whatever. What I find the most value, which you mentioned before, was having those, I don't do it monthly, but I do quarterly meetings with my CPA. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's April. It looks like this is how much money I'm going to make. What in the world do I need to do between now and the end of the year to make sure that number is the, the least amount possible? Um, and I, you know, I do think there are certain things that you can do towards the end of the year. Um, like to my point about, you know, if, if you're, if it's November and you're, you realize crap, maybe, maybe you got a, a, a big chunk of cash at the end that you, you weren't, uh, you weren't expecting. Number one, you can go find a limited part. You can find an LP deal. That's why people at the end of the year tend to, to invest a lot because, you know, they want that bonus depreciation. Uh, so, so getting that, and then there's other mechanisms. I know there's some other CPAs in here, but, um, you know, conservation easements, for example, is a, is a great way. And again, you need some time. That's almost like it is kind of a syndication. So again, December 15th is probably too late, but here we are in October. I mean, you've still got, you know, almost three months to, uh, to figure it out. And so to me, those are my two big things. Number one is do they have expertise, you know, because so they don't have to look it up. If they're, if they're investing in real estate, they know what all the real estate stuff is. And then just somebody who's looking forward to who's actually planning as opposed to just here's, you know, like H&R Block where you're just going to hand them a bunch of docs and they prepare your returns. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, Alan, is it Alan? Yeah, it's Alan, D-R-E-A-L-L-C. So is it Alan? Or am I completely butchering that? Unmute yourself, please. Well, uh, actually, this is Andrea. There you go. So not even close. Sorry. Hey, Andrea. Oh, that's the name. Oh, there's your website. Sorry. It's, it's, yes. It's, got it. But, but it. It, I had it on Alan's name either. That's my partner and he's actually in the room too. That's hilarious. Okay. So, so how you doing, Andrea? We're flip-flopping. That's um, right. I'm excellent. Great to talk to you. Great to talk to you. Um, I am working on just now getting into the whole syndication thing. And I'm wanting to know more about what I can say to who. And I wanted to know where I should be looking up the regulations for the SEC so that I don't say the wrong thing in an email or in person or on a YouTube or a Instagram or anything like that. So where should I be looking for that? You think there's like the SEC just has a, a booklet out there that gives you all the answers? <laughs> uh, look, it starts with understanding what type of, it always starts with the exemption that you're going to be relying on, right? So that's why that's why I typically recommend talking to somebody who's in the, you know, me or, or, or who, who you're going to pick as a security, or even if you haven't picked a security, to talk to them early because you want to get some information about whether this is going to be a 506B deal, right? So you're only going to be 
you know, talking to people you have pre-existing relationships because the things you can tell somebody that you need a pre-existing substantive relationship with will be different from conversations that you, you know, can talk to the public. So depending on the exemption that you use will dictate what you can and kind of say. Um, it, most of the issues come down to on a 506B deal because you're not allowed to advertise or generally solicit. And so anything that goes on social media uh, becomes an issue, right? And so there's things that you clearly can say, things you clearly cannot say, and things that are in, in, the, in, the, in the gray area, in the gray zone. Uh, we did a live, I think it was like one of the early ones, three or four, or somewhere in the first five episodes that was just all on social media advertising. But the, the cliff notes of that is you can always talk about, you know, factual information about you and your company. So what are your values? What do you do? Are you a mobile home park investor? Are you a real estate? Are you a single family? Like that kind of stuff. What's your values? Are you cash flow? Are you equity? Are you developer? All that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, and you can always provide value. Value add is my favorite way of communicating. Like not talking about a specific, by the way, you're never going to sell a deal by just talking about the numbers right off the bat. So if you don't know them that well, talk about your philosophy, talk about what you guys do, tell you what markets. So, so value add would be, look, I'm in the Jacksonville, Florida market. And this is why here are the 10 reasons I love it. Or I'm in the mobile home park space because I love the tax benefits or I love the affordable housing or I love whatever it is that you love. Uh, providing value can always be, be the way. One-on-one uh, -on -one talks are easier. If you're like having lunch with somebody or coffee, you can always probably get away with a little bit more because it's not really being said anywhere. But the, the, the big thing is just staying away from talking about a specific deal unless you have that pre-existing substantive relationship. Once you have a pre-existing substantive relationship or you're doing a 506C, then the only thing I worry about is the anti-fraud provisions. So the states still have, you still have to be careful about making sure that if, whatever you do say that you're not misleading, right? That's why a lot of times you see these disclaimers and that's why attorneys get nervous when you just start talking without having a business plan or something. Because at least on the business plan, there's some disclaimers and say, look, you, you got to review a PPM. This is, this, is, this is not an offer and all that stuff. Because you start talking to people about a returns or stuff like that. You haven't talked about all the risks that go alongside the returns. So I know that wasn't a great quite a great answer in terms of specifics. I would encourage you to check out wh whatever episode it was. Uh, I want I want to say it was like four or five. It's pretty early on, and we did a whole hour on on social media advertising. So I'd recommend uh, that's probably a good resource for you. Yeah, because I was looking for some of those disclosures to put on the bottom of my emails and stuff. Because I'm like, I don't know if I'm saying stuff bad. I'm not talking about a specific deal, but. If you go to the Facebook community, mauriceroll.com forward slash FB group, I dropped the disclaimer language. I don't know how long ago, a couple months ago or something. And so, um, and if you, if you guys ever need anything like that, please just, I mean, that's what the community is for. So I spent most of my day hanging out in there anyway. So if you need like an email, you know, I would recommend everybody have email disclaimers. Uh, and so if you guys need some help with language like that, just, just drop a comment or, or a post or whatever in, on the community. And I see them all and I'm, I'm happy to help there. Awesome. And I look forward to talking to you one-on-one -on -one at some point because we need you. <laughs> I appreciate it, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tenny Williams, how are you? Good evening. I'm, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us again. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, so I um, have two separate questions. One is kind of like what the young man just asked. And uh, so I have a, a, a CPA right now that uh, used to work at PwC. So he has a great resume. But now that we're starting to move into actually buying the properties, he sends me back a proposal that is like a couple of thousand per month per property. Um, and I thought it was high. So um, I, don't, I just kind of wanted to find out whether that sounded high or not. And the second thing was, um, I have the premium LinkedIn. And so with the premium LinkedIn, you know, you're able to see who, who checked out your profile. And uh, since we just got filed with, uh, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Commission um, I had someone from the SEC looking at my profile. So I'm like, spooked. Wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, uh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. That, that, yeah, I don't know what, what that's yeah, about, says, obviously. It's, yeah, it says he's, he's an accountant, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission accountant. You know, I, you know, there's so, I mean, maybe at some point they'll be, be over. I mean, they're so understaffed. I, I, I find it difficult to believe that's, that the staff is, is actually spending time, you know, 
going through. So, I mean, so it's, unless there was already sort of a separate review or something, they just happen to want to look at your, your stuff. But, and, and by the way, generally it's not going to be the SEC. It's going to be your state regulator. So wherever, and not even your state regulator, the regulator uh, in the state where the investor is, who usually complains, because that's usually the first step is there's some kind of complaint. Very rarely do, does a regulator out of the blue pick up the phone and call you because they're doing random aud audits. It's almost always an investor complaining putting in a phone call to the state or the feds, which then triggers an audit and opening up a file and then people starting to do business. Um, so I, I obviously don't know what that's about, but uh, keep us posted on that on, on, on future lives. And then look, I would just, you look, I would give WealthAbility a call because then you can compare prices. I think that's uh, that's pretty- Okay, that's, that's true. Okay, thank you. So just give me a buzz, yeah. All right, let's do one more and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap it here at 5.30, uh, bottom of the hour, unless, uh, and I know there's a ton, a ton of questions, so- um, I know we're gonna have to have Tom back. I mean, I almost felt like I didn't really need to be here. I could have just uh, let uh, Tom speak, which is usually his uh, his MO, which is why I love him. Uh, all right, guys, um, I will um, I'll be in the in the Facebook community again, and then I will I will post the uh, the winner of the tax free wealth autograph copy, which is actually right here somewhere. So anyway, I'll put that in the in the Facebook community, and uh, I will see you guys uh, next week. Thanks everyone for joining. Appreciate you guys.